Happy Arbor Day and welcome to the season finale of Public Eye News. Today, a look at some Arbor Day events you can attend and later an update on the anti-Israel investment protests flaring up at college campuses across the country. Our very own Nolan Schaefer will let us know when to expect warmer weather conditions to move in and Luke Nittle will have a look back at an exciting NFL draft in your sports breakdown. I'm Melissa Santour. And I'm Marin Parks and this is Public Eye News. Today is Arbor Day and the Nagani Public Library celebrated the holiday earlier with an open to the public story time featuring songs, stories, rhymes and crafts, all centered around the importance and impact of trees on the environment. Moreover, if you've been considering planting a tree of your own, there is no better time to do so as the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources currently has step-by-step -step instructions on how to plant both burlap and potted tree seedlings. Additionally, there are a variety of other ways to get involved with the holiday from community organized events and celebrations to visiting the Department of Natural Resources website to complete activities and learn more about trees and their importance. And an announcement from the Marquette Area Blues Society posted earlier today indicates that while this year's Blues Fest is shaping up to be the best one yet, with several Grammys and Blues Music Award nominees and winners coming to the stage, it will also be the final iteration of the event. Members of the Blues Society say that while they are proud of many successful years and events, many of their members have been working on these festivals since they began and are finding it increasingly difficult to keep up with the demands of doing so after 20 years. They also cite rising event costs and difficulties attracting and retaining volunteers to keep the event running smoothly as reasons for the ending of the event, but at the same time they wish to assure fellow Marquette Blues lovers that this transition is the end of an era, not of the society, and that they intend to continue Blues Day Tuesday and other educational outreach programs. This graduating season is more than just an accomplishment. For some, it's a family affair. Mother and daughter Christy Peterson and Nadia Rosemurgy get to walk across the stage together at Northern Michigan University's commencement ceremony this May. Peterson enrolled as part of NMU's global campus to achieve her bachelor's degree after a long-term dream of finishing her higher education she started in 1993. She says her daughter has been her biggest supporter, as she has achieved a bachelor's in just two years through the online applied workplace leadership program. NMU's commencement will air live right here on WNMU TV 13 on May 4th. And a statement has been released today following the Great Lakes PFAS Action Network supported bill being introduced to the state legislature. This new Hazardous Product Act is now requiring manufacturers to make known if they are using forever chemicals in their products, including cookware, cosmetics, cleaning products, firefighting foam, and more. This new act will be starting in 2027, taking a tiered approach until 2032, where all avoidable forever chemicals in products will be prohibited by the state. And just north of La Crosse in Wisconsin, one town's mayoral race was in disarray when nobody wrote their name on the ballot. That was until one write-in candidate stepped up to the challenge. Ken Kosarowski of WKBT has a story from Fountain City. Behind me is Fountain City, the oldest settlement in all of Buffalo County, the River Bluff capital of the world, and home to just over 800 people. The only problem here is nobody seems to want to run for mayor. Fountain City streets are quiet this time of year. You might find some county residents stopping by to have lunch, play cards, or at City Hall, some pickleball. You will not find anyone who put their name on the ballot for mayor this spring. Honestly, it was a surprise. I figured somebody would run. I didn't want an 87-year-old woman running the town. It's been worse. So in April, all 82 Fountain City votes were write-ins. The top candidate, a 75-year-old former Fountain City mayor, who told City Hall he'd like to stay retired. The city then turned to another popular name, 46-year-old Ben Adank. Really running for mayor was the furthest thing from my mind. Adank is CEO for IT company iTechra out of Winona. He's no stranger to local government. He was once chair for the town of Milton, just up the road from Fountain City. There's really no honeymoon period to this because my phone has been ringing and I've run into people in the community and there's all sorts of wonderful ideas. He's a smart guy. I think he's going to do a real good job. But if there wasn't a Ben Adank willing to step up, the city could be in a real pickle. I think people in our community really do care and are passionate about the issues of the community, but eh, they just they just don't want to, to serve. Jeff Mastin is a retired teacher now renovating a riverfront restaurant in the city. He says Fountain City is just a local example of a national problem. Political leadership is very polarizing in our society today, and so it can be something that divides our community. So I think people 
people stay away from it. I think we need to continue growing future leaders so we don't end up in these situations any longer. And for Chapleski, it's a reminder that democracy only works when the people are paying attention. I think we all have a responsibility to be informed and involved when the opportunity presents itself. It's easy to slack off going, oh, it's snowing outside, I don't feel like going out, whatever. No, that vote counts. And don't touch that dial because after this short break, Nolan will have your weather update and I'll be right back with your national news. Stay tuned. We cover all the angles. We report the facts. We find clarity. PBS is here, delivering the credible, reliable, thoughtful election coverage you need to make informed decisions. PBS, your trusted election source. Hi, welcome back to Public Eye News, and I'm Nolan Schaefer with your weather today. First, we'll be taking a look at our school sky cam, and as you can see, we are experiencing some partly cloudy skies, but overall some nice weather here in Marquette. And taking a look at current conditions across the UP, we are experiencing um, an elevated wildfire potential in all counties except for the Cunha County because of dry and um, wind conditions. And taking a look into the temperatures across the UP, up in Houghton, it is 59 degrees and sunny in Iron Mountain, or Ironwood, sorry, is 59 and partly cloudy. And Iron Mountain is 58 and mostly sunny. And Menominee is 52 and mostly sunny. And then in Escanaba, it is 50 and sunny. And Manistique, it is 49 and sunny. Sault Ste. Marie, same weather, but 53 degrees. And in the lovely Marquette, it is 45 and mostly cloudy. And taking a look into current conditions further, and the uh, winds are coming out of the south southeast at eight miles per hour, and the barometric pressure is 30.04 inches and falling. And looking forward to tonight's uh, conditions, you can expect some rain occurrences, a low of 44, winds out of the southeast at 16, and the moon phase for tonight is going to be in waning gibbous. And looking forward to tomorrow, you can experience some thunderstorms with a high of 57, a low of 35, and winds out of the south southwest at 15. And looking forward to this weekend, you can expect a high of 38 for Sunday, a low of 36, and some occasional showers. Monday, same weather, but a high of 56, a low of 43. And then on Tuesday, you can expect a high of 55, a low of 48, and some more showers. That's all I have for weather today. Back to you at the desk. Thank you so much for that weather update. I'm looking forward to seeing the Mayflowers brought by these April showers, but let's jump right into our national news. A net neutrality order preventing internet providers from favoring certain apps and websites over others was reinstated yesterday in a 3-2 vote by the Federal Trade Commission. The vote, which determined whether or not to reinstate a 2015-issued order from the Obama administration that was repealed in 2017 by the Trump administration, was split along party lines with Democrats in favor and Republicans against. The goal of net neutrality is to require internet providers to treat all websites equally, and the passing of this order is not expected to notably affect user internet experience due to several local net neutrality laws passed since the original repeal in 2017, particularly in the states of Colorado, California, Maine, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington, whose citizens will likely experience little to no change. And protests regarding university involvement with pro-Israeli companies and policies have broken out with increasing frequency on campuses across the United States, including here at our very own Northern Michigan University, with some ending in negotiations and others ending in the arrest and detainment of student protesters. A primary form of protest at these campuses is the setting up of encampments that are intended to be easily visible to families of graduating students during May commencement season. University response to these encampments has been primarily negative, with police being called on several occasions to disrupt or entirely tear down the tent cities due to claims of them creating an unsafe or volatile environment. And they've been called spooky and sinister, but bats impact our lives in ways we might not realize. CBS's Dana Batches takes a look at why the animals are known as the heroes of the night and the threats they're facing. They are mysterious, only come out at night, and are most often associated with scary things. But there's nothing creepy about what bats do for the environment. They're not only cute, um, but they do these amazing roles, like for our ecosystem. Joseph Curdy is a bat biologist at UCLA who took us to see the fast flying mammals in action. We wouldn't have coffee, we wouldn't have chocolate, we wouldn't have tequila without bats. Like, that should be enough. Over 300 species of fruit depend on bats for pollination. 
They help disperse seeds and also play an essential role in pest control, saving U.S. farmers billions of dollars a year in crop damage and pesticides. Bats can eat like up to half their body weight in insects per night. It's why among the lemon and avocado trees on the Lloyd Butler Ranch in Southern California, there's a bat detector. They can alter the insect communities that exist here. Bats can exert uh, a suppression effect on insects just by flying around and existing. Rachel Blakey, an assistant professor of global change biology at Cal Poly Pomona and her students are working with ranch manager Michael Sullivan. I am learning more about how they will improve the systems that we have here. For all the good they do, bats are declining around the globe due to loss of habitat because of development, extreme weather events caused by climate change and disease. It's very daunting. I'm going to be honest with you. It's very daunting knowing that there are all these multitudes of factors that are leading to their declines and a general apathy by um, just regular people towards bats. For scientists, the hope is to reshape the narrative around the misunderstood creatures and focus on the vital things bats do for us. Donya Backus, CBS News, Los Angeles. And wait right there. After this short break, Luke Niddle will have a look at what's happening on the ice in your Public Ice Sports Breakdown, coming up next. ...of Northern Michigan University. We are so proud of you for this major accomplishment. Congratulations, you did it! Watch the 2024 Spring Commencement here on WNMU-TV, Saturday, May 4th at 10.30. Welcome back to Public Eye Sports. I'm your host, Luke Niddle, and I'll be taking you through our Friday breakdown. Kicking off with the NFL, the first round of the draft concluded last night, and the first 32 picks included a barrage of offensive players. In total, 23 selections were offense, an NFL record since the common draft era began in 1967. Six QBs flew off the board within the first 12 picks, another NFL record, and the first draft featured six quarterbacks taken in the first round since 1983. Some head-scratching moves were made in the 2024 draft, including the Atlanta Falcons confoundingly taking Michael Penix Jr. eighth overall. ATL notably signed Kirk Cousins to a four-year, $180 million deal in the early stages of free agency this year. Another questionable move was made by the Buffalo Bills, who strangely traded back with their arch rivals in the Kansas City Chiefs, which allowed KC to select Xavier Worthy, who ran the fastest 40-yard dash ever. And moving over to the Stanley Cup playoffs, round one is starting to come to a close for a select few series with a couple of teams on the ropes. One such case is the Tampa Bay Lightning, who have allowed the Florida Panthers to win three games in a playoff series against them for the first time ever. Down 3-0, the Bolts need a spark and badly if they have any hopes of digging themselves out of their self-made rut. Another squad down 3-0 is the New York Islanders, who are dangerously close to becoming caught up in the storm of the Carolina Hurricanes. The Canes have given the Isles jab after jab in most games and even forced New York to pull goaltender Ilya Sorokin after going down 3-1. Again, if the Isles have any hopes of winning, they have to throw everything but a kitchen sink at Carolina tomorrow afternoon. And staying on the topic of up 3-0, the Denver Nuggets have taken a commanding lead over the Los Angeles Lakers in the NBA playoffs. A 112-105 W put the Lakers, puts, over the Lakers puts the Nuggets in prime position to sweep LA and continue their tour as the defending champions. Over in the East, a 50-point surge by Joel Embiid rocketed the 76ers past the Knicks to make the series 2-1. That's all I have for sports. Back to the news desk. And thank you guys so much for joining us for another season of Public Eye News. We'd like to thank you for watching, and we'd like to thank all our graduating seniors, Melissa, Lily, Kenzie, and Andrew. And Marin. And we hope to see you all next season. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, that should be all the time that we have today, and we will see you next year. Bye. The preceding program was produced by WNMU-TV, Northern Michigan University Public Television, in studios located in Elizabeth and Edgar Hardin Hall.